welcome back. We're glad uh, you're into part two of the introduction to marketing in chapter one um, and how in recreation, tourism, leisure, recreation organizations, uh, we are embracing the marketing concept and tools uh, more and more, but that we still have a ways to go. So that first section of the video and PowerPoint I tried to share in that first chapter too that we are in evolution, that marketing is and will continue to change. And the real question is, have our organization changed along with that? So to summarize and continue to move forward in this chapter, I wanna first share again, um, why we have this little but growing interest just briefly. And uh, first of all, again, we know in our organizations, the literature is just still quite young. We, not till the 80s and 90s, do we see that erupting. Um, nonprofit agencies historically in our field felt really little need, where today they do feel need. And they know they're running organizations with the same kinds of practices of for-profit businesses, just with a different objective. So um, there's no longer serving everyone. We are serving uh, we, none of us are serving everyone, and I can show and share how every nonprofit agency, although they think they want to utilize everyone uh, strategically, shouldn't be uh, under the premise of everyone is their market and they should try and reach everyone because they will fail. Um, since the 90s, again, accreditation issues, as I mentioned in the first section. So we weren't required to teach you about marketing concepts until the 1990s. It's no wonder, again, that many of our organizations don't fully understand or embrace the concept. Many agencies do believe they're integrating marketing, yet few really are doing it from this 21st century kind of perspective. And in this section of our chapter, I want to highlight this you know, ev evolution of history we've gone through and really start zoning in on from your interview, maybe in the field, as well as your perspective. Um, are we there? You know, are we really in a 21st century kind of mode today? And more importantly, what's marketing look like in the future? So as we do that, and again, recognizing that people really like this topic now. Marketing is a hot issue, and I mentioned in our last uh, section, um, kind of the buzzwords and the things that are really important to people, but we're going to look at it again from a very strategic and a very tactical approach um, to use uh, this powerful tool in the most advantageous way that we can. So what is marketing? And in the chapter one, I do kind of formally defined a fairly long-winded definition of marketing. So um, I'll always just find it important that you think about all these elements and why I've put them in the definition. Not so much that I'll say to you, restate this definition. I want you to think of your own definition and how would you explain what marketing really is to an organization that you're working for in our field? You know, do they really understand how it fits in? And, and I want you to think about that during our, our time here right now. So what is marketing? Um, the best definition I ever saw someone put on my desk and I can't even tell you who the author is. But if the circus is coming to town and you paint a sign saying, circus coming to the fairground Saturday, we call that advertising, right? We're reaching the people. But if you put the sign on the back of an elephant and you walk them through town, that's a promotion. And actually, that's when the circus came to Grand Rapids as an example, that's actually what they did. They went from DeVos, um, uh, or Van Andel Arena, I should say, Van Andel Arena, down through Restaurant Row, I call that, you know, where, and they'd take the elephants down through there and people would just walk out of buildings and, and see that. And it was a great way to get attention um, and very unique. Now, quite recently, the, the elephants aren't coming to town anymore with the circus, but that's a whole separate issue. And uh, so work with me on this example. If the elephant walked through the mayor's flower bed, we call that publicity. But if the mayor laughs about it, we call that public relations because public relations is positive media attention that we get for free. But if you planned that whole thing, we call that marketing. So marketing is really about strategy and the tactical things are very smart decisions by an organization. So I love that quick example when we try to capture what we mean by strategy and tactics together. It's a lot of things we're doing, but we're doing them for a very smart and wise reason. So 
So as we look at that formal definition, um, it's integrating effective strategic and operational communication concepts and practices driven by various people in an organization that influence us and really practiced by everyone. So I hope in the first section you really started to think more about places you've worked and how they approach marketing. And my guess is you're gonna find that they look at it kind of narrowly. It's usually one person's job in an organization and you just say, oh, they're the marketer versus everyone's the marketer. You know, hope some of you, and you need to email me or call me and tell me if you work for an organization that really gets on their job descriptions that every one of us is a marketer. So, but also the decisions tend to be by that one person who might have the job or the small team of people who are the marketing sales team. Um, that it's not thought of that everyone should have a chance to be involved in those decisions. You know, I, time and time again, I utilize a, a kind of a tool that people make decisions on their own and then in a group setting, they make them together. And 95% of the time, the group makes better decisions than the individual. And I venture to say in your life, you know, in my life too, when I think about that, when I have a group of people around helping me make a decision, that decision is always better because I have so much talent in the people that you know and you and you facilitate a conversation that even though that conversation might not be easy to hear or facilitate, the outcome generally most often is more powerful than alone. So with that, to think of involving everyone and everyone's job description knowing, and if we all thought of ourselves as marketers and we were all feeling like we were engaged in the process kind of idea, and, and I say not only employees and consumers or visitors, but also our volunteers, our board members, our suppliers, our donors, all the people who have a vested interest in what we do. So we call those stakeholders, and I want you to think very broadly about all the people in the organizations you've worked for that have an influence, and I bet they could have helped with that marketing process. So marketing, marketing today, again, to find, again, long-winded, I'll give it to you, I agree, but several kind of key words I don't want you to forget. Everyone involved, everyone practices it, strategic elements, that are both operational and communication oriented. Creating the best experience for Bill Shepler on the ferry boat required his captains, his deckhands, his ticket takers, his staff, operational people to make that experience so worthwhile that I talked about in the first part. But then we had to communicate that experience to people and tell them we were doing the ferry boat ride that goes under the bridge. If, if we had the best operational things but never told anybody about it, we would fail. So marketing involved, strategically gathering the data and information to even think about that, operationally implementing a really high quality experience and then communicating that to people so they come. In that, marketing can no longer be this one little department and thought of, oh, run down to the marketing person and go ask them to do that for us. No, marketing has to be integrated throughout that organization. So having um, said that, as we move forward, the practices will ultimately deliver high quality experiences to reach and exceed the expectation of the people we serve. And we serve employees, we serve volunteers, we serve donors, we serve board members, right? And we serve the external guest. So always focused on our organizational objectives, very metric oriented, very measurement oriented, um, evaluating our decisions to see if they've produced that return. Because I don't want to be that organization that when things get tough, they go, oh, let's eliminate marketing because it just costs us money. No, we want to know and prove um, our value and worth and show the return of investment. And when we fail and make poor decisions, we don't want to do those time and time again. And I've seen that a lot in our organizations where we keep doing the coupon book again but we don't even know if the coupon book is worth it. It just feels good because we're making decisions, right? We're doing things, but I want to do the right things. I want a career that's done the right things that has allowed me to feel really good about my decisions, but also reap the benefit of, of those decisions. A more successful organization, um, I'm more proud of my, my work in the field, etc. Okay, so things to think about, about where you've worked, what you've done, what you think about marketing. I hope already we're influencing your thoughts on the whole idea of where our industry is and maybe where we should be. So let's start with the idea of how a company is created. And the idea here is to think about 
okay, where should marketing be? And if we think about it, companies are first created or organizations because there's some need out there. You know, you're living in a town that doesn't have great fine dining, you know, restaurants. You're living in a town that has nothing to do. You know, you're, you're sitting around your kitchen table and you're going, geez, someone should invent this, right? So because we need it and no one's made it before. So the whole idea is every great organization should be formed around the idea that we can do this better, we can do this at all because it's never been done before. But the whole idea that people need something and they've told us because we've asked them, do you need this? And if you do, then let's give it to you kind of idea. But you can't do that alone. There are a lot of businesses that die right at the kitchen table kind of idea. They're really clever ideas and really smart because people need them, but they don't get off the ground. And generally I say to you, why is that? You know, great ideas, great thoughts, because you need something else. The great thought can't get implemented until you have some things. So the second thing we know we need to create an organization is a great concept, a great experience, something people need and want, right? But we also need resources to do that. So we know stockholders, shareholders, donors, deep pockets, might be your deep pockets, might be somebody else's, but we need investors, we need capital, to actually make this happen, whether capital to create the products or services, capital build a building, um, but we're gonna need a resource. So a lot of ideas die before they ever get that capital or resource to have happen. But we know again, even when we get the capital, we can't do it without the people kind of idea. So the three pronged approach are employees or shareholders or volunteers, employees is a loose term here, to then go back to the top and go back to the customer, the external person who wants to consume what we're doing. So on a simple level, I think of, you know, organizations are really created with those things, a really core great experience or great idea that has investors or resources available to them to do and create it, but then has the high quality person to deliver it. Because again, remember, the base of all great marketing is what? Oh, I heard ya. It's the quality of the experience. You're right. So all of those ingredients are key. We get the big data to understand needs, make sure we're creating something of value that people want. We get the investors and we deliver it in a high way. So it only makes sense to me that marketing is situated in the middle of that. And our job is to find out what people need, right? To help get investors and create information and find the great people to help deliver that. And our job should be to support all of those endeavors in the organization um, to be as effective as possible. But typically we don't see that in organizations and I'll get to that in just one second. So over time, we don't see that because we see how marketing, if I pick up a textbook from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, 2000, you're gonna see changes over time uh, and what we're talking about is different. It goes back to what I said in part one, that the book I wrote was outdated the minute it went to press. And that's what we'll see. And so I've, I've cut to the chase here and gave you a couple paragraphs about each kind of decade or so. But let me just summarize that in this quick table. So we see in the 1960s in this first column, you'll note again that we're very product oriented. You know, we're mass marketing to everyone. We're selling widgets, you know, we're selling glasses, you know, that um, we make and then we go, let's go find the people. Well, everybody needs glasses, so let's go sell them to everyone kind of idea. Um, you'll read very little strategy in the 60s. You don't see textbooks talking about, you know, really strategic about how they go about. It was more about create something and they will come or go find them kind of idea. And it's really about my opinion as the manufacturer and come find me idea. But by the 80s, we already saw the information about marketing being looked at a little differently. We saw the word service being implemented. So again, keep in mind, our industry being largely service oriented, right, and intangible kind of experiences um, aren't even talked about until the 80s in marketing textbooks. And we started to read about segments of business. Now, I was a marketer in the 80s full time. That's when I did it. And we well, I worked for a monster, you know, corporation, a worldwide organization called Marriott, you know, and, and working for Marriott, I had that luxury because we had really sophisticated marketing even back then. So I feel very lucky that I had a chance to work and learn from an organization that was really sophisticated. And we talked about marketing segments back then, 
but there weren't a lot of other organizations talking about it. And even today, I'd suggest to you, we work in HTM organizations that don't think of themselves as anything but trying to serve everyone. Um, less and less are thinking that way. And at least now we more think along the lines our people are segmented into certain groups because they think about our product or experience differently. You know, a senior citizen is going to think about my amusement park a little differently than um, a family of young children under five. And they're going to think about it differently than the group of teenagers that are coming from their school, you know, or their church. So we know that people are different. What we think about in the 80s though is we were very kind of war oriented in terms of competition we just tried to devour the competition that was kind of our whole objective you know we weren't really thinking strategically in the 60s but by the 80s we're like oh we get this this is like war we'll just go after the other guy so even in the 80s during my career you know we saw a lot more price war kinds of things you know this hotel would charge um, $99. So I'd say, geez, oh, Pete, we can beat that. We'll go to $80. Well, what we realized during the war is maybe no one kind of wins in that um, related to running an organization. You know, price wars uh, erode the, the market to such that the consumer might win short term, but they're not going to win long term because the quality of services are going to be impacted as a result of all that. Um, so what's the right price for the right kinds of services and the fair price that the market is willing to buy? Um, we just have changed, thank goodness, off of the war mentality and uh, it's been moving forward. So back in the 80s, we also, though, realized that we should talk to customers. We should ask them what they think about our experience. And I'd like to, to say that back then we started the survey after the experience and, and we really looked at kind of we created the experience, but then we at least measured how they felt about it. And that's when that, you know, comment cards um, and surveys after the experience kind of started. Again, varying degrees across our field, who adopted that early and who adopted it late. But we, we saw that evident in HTM back in the 80s. So by 2000, I'd like to say the literature at least talked about and textbooks talked about um, Marketing in 2000 was all about an experience. And we've seen that thrown around now, but it's already 2015. <laughs> so for 15 years, uh, you know, we wrote about this back in early 2000 about, it's no longer as product or service, but people are really looking for these emotionally engaging experiences that do more than just provide a service. They change people, they impact people. And in no other industry I can think of that, than hospitality and tourism and recreation and leisure, have we got that opportunity and made it easier? You know, you see insurance companies trying to say that, come to our insurance company and we're going to change your life. Well, they have a much harder time at trying to do that than someone who's working in a resort or a food service establishment or designing the cherry festival, you know, the national cherry festival and providing an event to people. We innately have the kinds of things that can be life-changing and very emotionally driven for people. So I like that at least the literature started to help us recognize that, um, but we have a much easier job. And, and uh, you know, if you look at the old MasterCard commercials where they uh, talk about priceless experiences, they were largely based in our industry. Go to a ball game with your child and create the experience, but spend it all on MasterCard kind of idea. But those commercials, and you start to see I imagine some of the uh, hot communication items that you're pulling right now in Chapter 1 for our assignment, you're probably finding that it's organizations who've created an experience out of it. Certainly some of the beer companies, certainly um, you know, some of the Coke and beverage companies, they're really good with the national advertising, making it a life-changing thing as a result of drinking that beverage. So look at those things but we're all not there yet we all aren't ready to operationally create these magical experiences for our visitors um, and that's a shame but we'll, we'll hopefully get there but 2000 you know 21st century started target marketing certainly too we certainly read it in the literature no longer it was just recognizing we had segments but we were strategic in the literature about targeting groups of people i really whether i was for profit or non-profit did only look at certain groups of people. I didn't want to serve everybody. I recognize they're in different groups. But now I am just going after 
senior citizens who live 60 miles away who have interest in fitness and wellness and socialization as an example. So targeted markets were the hot thing in 21st century marketing. And again, I venture to say our industry dabbles in target marketing. We might know we have groups of people we're going after, but we, we still could get much more sophisticated with that whole concept. Partnerships, instead of no strategy or a war strategy, now we really have a much healthier way of going about thinking about how we strategize in terms of our competition. And we look now at partnering or niching ourselves and not devouring each other, but finding our place in that sea of offerings. So I'll use the fitness industry as an example. And you know, in any one town, even small towns, you'll have multiple fitness providers. Um, and, and slowly we've seen this emergence of finding their niche in that field versus just trying to be like each other and devour each other. So I love the, the concept of curves as an example. Curves came in and looked around the fitness industry and said, okay, we could all create the same kind of fitness facilities and places for the hardcore fitness user between the ages of you know 20 and 50. Um, and we can do that and just create new ones and twist it and twink it. Or we can look at who's not being served. You know, what group of people looking around the room um, out of all people who might have fitness interest but are there barriers to them going to those atypical historic places? And Curbs sat around and said, how about women? How about women that are out of shape necessarily? And women who are not only out of shape, but wouldn't be caught dead in a typical fitness center because they don't have the, the outfit and they don't want to wear the outfit. They might want to come in their khakis or their jeans. And you know what? And they don't want to stay for an hour and a half and make this whole, but, but they'd like to be healthier. They'd like to live you know, better, but, um, or in a way, I shouldn't say better, but I should say uh, in a, in a long-term healthier, feel better maybe kind of way, but I'm not going in a fitness center like that. And Curves realized there was a market out there and they created the product and experience for that market. And to me, it's a brilliant way of thinking about partnering in a way because they're not going after the same market. They're in the same industry though and they could do a lot of collaborative kind of things because maybe they could take that curves market they're going after and then get them to a place that they might be ready to go into those kind of fitness places. And so I see some logical partnerships and I think in our industry we have more and more opportunities to partner not only with maybe a competitor but certainly an indirect competitor. So now as a hotel, I partner with a restaurant and I partner with an amusement park or an attraction or a museum or a entertainment venue. And more and more we do things that instead of fighting each other, let's, let's pull it together and do something better as a result. So we've certainly seen some movement in that direction. It's really an exciting area. I think that's such a healthy, good, powerful way of looking at our industry when we are very, uh, segmented as an industry but we need each other you know there isn't one of us that can do it alone without all of those providers from transportation and travel to get there to attractions to food service to lodging to um, gas stations to merchandise etc so so way cool way to, to think about it and then in 2000 you know we really saw literature talking about being scientific and customized um, in regards to consumers. So in the 80s, if, if we were just asking them after the experience, by 2000, now we're asking them before the experience. So the example I gave earlier with Shuplers was, was what we mean. Let's talk about, get them involved in the experience with us in terms of deciding what we want to do. And then we ask them and we do it. Guess what? It's going to be way easier to get them to come to us in that way. It's kind of like the whole employees involved and volunteers involved in marketing decisions. Well, it's no different in terms of the customer experience. Get the customers involved in it, and guess what? They will come. So, and it'll be the right thing to offer. So, on a simple level, I say there are a couple things in marketing I would never run an organization without doing. And one is talking to the people, for one, whether it's formal research or having dialogue, but letting our customers, our employees, our volunteers be involved in decisions about our operations, point one. Two is understand who our competition is and understand what they're doing inside and out. Remember the ferry boat visit? How was I about to make a decision about how to help Shepler's Ferry market themselves if I didn't know what those other experiences were like? 
couldn't find their niche or our competitive advantage in the sea of offerings until you do your homework. So if, if I can help them get data or big data about customers, about competition, about uh, what we're doing, what we're not doing, et cetera, that kind of scientific and customized feedback um, is critical anymore. So we started hearing about it in 2000, but boy, today I wouldn't run an organization without, 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 without that kind of insight because uh, it makes it so much easier to make these decisions. Um, and I want to be effective at my decisions. Remember, we're all going to spend a marketing budget, but I want to spend it really well and, and produce those outcomes. So the real question for today is, what does 2020 look like? I mean, it is, is literally around the corner for one, but what is movement in those four categories? We went from a product, a service, and experience to what next? We go from mass to segmented to targeted to what? You know, history tells us it's going to change. And if we're not ready and anticipating those changes, I want to be on the forefront of thinking about that. Um, so there's two things I want you to do for, for me today. And in our discussion board, you'll see a post that says chapter one video regarding history. And what I want you to do is think about this chart. Let me see if I can get this on here the right way. So with the chart, you're to do, you're to do, is to fill in your idea in these areas and what would that be what would you think and just shoot some ideas to show me one you're watching the video but two you're thinking about this and what would this column what kind of words come to mind that you think is going to you know be the next big thing so task shoot okay post your thoughts on our discussion board in our Blackboard site. All I need are some words related to what you'd put here. So as we think about this whole section in chapter one, this to me is as important as what I talked about last time, you know, in terms of well, what's our attitude and our philosophy about what marketing is and what it should be, but what are the real practical aspects of where marketing has come and where it is. In your interview of your site, I want you to think of this chart too. And I want you to think about where would you put them? You know, where would they fall? Um, I would say and suggest to you that in the last couple semesters, when we've done an in-class discussion on this topic, um, our students have concluded uh, very confidently that we're stuck in the 90s. And that's, in fact, one day I'm going to write an article about it because I think it's a great, a great little tagline, stuck in the 90s, that our marketing practices and HTM collectively over 150 students in the last um, three semesters um, have had the discussion about this chart in class, and they've concluded that we are stuck in the 90s. So our job is let's get out of the 90s. And more importantly, let's get to 2020 and just m make that trek quite quickly and the way we're going to do that is through you it's through you embracing the concept of marketing moving forward taking the tools we talk about in class in a very practical way and making a difference where you work and how you operate so in this section we've talked about this but i'll give you a very practical application this is an organizational chart from a complex recreation organization that has, as you noticed in the columns, parks on the left-hand side, golf, uh, recreation facilities, etc. And you'll notice kind of way down, I should make it like a game, because where is marketing? And more importantly, where should marketing be? And in this organization, you'll note, you'll find it looking at the chart straight on, the right-hand column below central services, the marketing specialist, one person, in the organization responsible for marketing but reports to the recreation and facilities manager golf you got to go all the way through someone else to even get to marketing parks you got to go all the way through etc so i suggest to you if you were going to create your own organizational chart about the organization you work for now where would you put it pretty common we see it maybe not embedded two layers down but maybe on that executive level layer Lots of organizations today, we see it as parks manager, golf manager, rec facilities manager, marketing manager, human resource manager, engineering manager, that kind of idea. Take care of facilities, take care of people, 
take care of marketing, take care of operations. So typical, we'll see those levels, um, but I'm not sure that even is in the right place. So today's environment, as we think about chapter one, I wanna see marketing move up to again be recognized as a tool and a concept and a value and a philosophy that has to permeate the whole organization. And maybe we should put it above the director, but no, I, I think the director has to be smart enough to make sure that they hire as their cohort in crime, marketing and operations embedded together, permeating everything. And that's gonna be the powerful HTM, recreation, leisure, hospitality, tourism, organization of the future. The one that gets that this tool needs to be embedded through everything we do and uh, we're gonna we're gonna all benefit as a result so when we think of uh, marketing you know I'll say to you and we've interviewed lots of um, organizations in our industry talking about why it is important and when we've gone to people and we've asked them why it's important they said and why they think it's a great tool is because it gives us focus towards achievable outcomes, measurable outcomes, things we're looking at doing. I want to get a thousand more senior citizens, you know, that um, come and visit us. I want to have 10 new donors or sponsors. I want to have employees that have longevity here and we have, you know, reduce our turnover by 25% this next year. So it gives and helps us be very focused and our actions relate to that focus. People have said before, they do things, but they're not doing the right things either. So it allows us for consistency and messages shared. Because marketing is at the top of the organization, we don't have golf doing something separate than uh, you know, banquet services or catering you know, or entertainment or anybody else. We're all doing the same thing because we have someone focused and helping us do things that were consistent and we're, we're connected better because of it. It improves and focuses on all relationships, and I hope you buy into this one alone. Typically, people think of marketing as only for the external guest. Oh, they're the people who go out and get the customers. Such a narrow view of marketing is really scary to me because we really should be focusing on all relationships, volunteers, donors, employees. Again, I know I've said it five times, but I want you to remember it, and I want you to pull that from this chapter that it's not about customers or guests alone. It is gonna focus on, therefore improve all relationships. It will help integrate the organization. And again, um, any one of these things is incredibly valuable on its own, but this to me is a direct competitive advantage. The more we work together as a team and do this together, focused and using these tools, the better we're gonna be. And then I will uh, debate and argue with the best of them that even though these activities will cost us some money and the money might be my time, it might be the direct cost for that coupon book or it might be the trade. You know, we gave away 10 rounds of golf so we could do a commercial on the radio, um, but it's going to be cost effective. One, because we're holding ourselves to outcomes, focus, a metric, but we're also measuring if it worked and we're learning from it as a result. And we're gonna use 2020 techniques, not just 21st century, but 2020, right? The next big things in marketing, we're gonna use those techniques to, to be really effective with it. So we've asked people uh, why it's important, what are they doing, those who buy into it, but not everybody does it, and we know that. So it'll be interesting for you to learn about this one organization because we're all gonna learn from that too. But I can tell you for the last 15 years, I've asked people regularly about why or why not. If you do it, why do you do it? And if you don't do it, why aren't you doing it? And really all of the barriers have kind of fallen into three categories. And those are fear, first off, fear that we don't have the skills, we don't know how, so I'm just gonna avoid it. And I, you know, I can relate to that, I, I hope you can too, that Sometimes it's just too much and I don't know what I'm doing or how I'm doing it, so I'm just not gonna really do it and I'll just keep doing these things that I've been doing for years, like the flyer that we post on the grocery store walls and we'll just keep doing it. Um, we have a fear that we're gonna do all this stuff and it's not gonna work and we have a fear that, um, again, 
if I do things and I think I'm good at it, but it doesn't work, I have a fear of failure, you know, and, and I say in marketing, we have to high five failure. So grab someone around you or high five yourself or do something, but we are going to screw up and we are going to make mistakes, but guess what? We're going to learn from it. And I think in marketing of all areas, we have to be ready to really try, think differently, act differently, be different. But be prepared that it might not always work and uh, you'll hear some real video stories from people in the field and you're going to see it always hasn't worked for them too and I hope you work for organizations or that you run an organization or you own an organization one day that you will reward that and uh, that the fear of failure keeps us all from great things and there's a lot of research right now about creativity being stifled because people have fear. So I get fear and I relate to fear and I think all of us can, but let, let's figure out a way how to reduce that. Disbelief, some people just, the reason they don't do marketing is they don't think it's gonna work. You know, I tried that coupon thing before and it didn't work. Um, I always like to say, give me anything that hasn't worked and let's figure out why it hasn't worked. Um, but I have yet to have anybody make me believe or prove to me that, uh, not doing these strategic things is going to be better decisions than doing them. So I think, again, it's really disbelief, but it might really be more fear or we tried it, didn't work, I'm done. So the last area is kind of they feel like they don't have a need. I'm the only one in town. I got as much business as I want. I'm happy the way things are. And in all three of these categories, I, I have I. I get scared for them for a variety of reasons, but the no need people really scare me because if you really are running an organization and you think you don't need to do any of these kinds of um, things because you've been lucky enough or fortunate to, to uh, be doing it this way, well, if you're that good and that confident, then you gotta believe someone's thinking about doing the same thing. So if you're lucky enough today, you're not gonna be lucky enough tomorrow. And I've seen organizations have these challenges where a new competitor comes and they are overwhelmed because they've never thought strategically about it. So all of a sudden they have a competition or a competitor come in and, and they're out of business. You know, nine out of 10 small businesses fail after five years. And why do they fail? You know, do they fail because it wasn't a great idea? I, my bias, I don't have the data to support it, but my bias is it's generally not because it's not a good idea. It's because it hasn't been strategically put into the market and really kind of refined. The concept or idea is good, but the refining toward meeting the needs of people um, hasn't been refined. It's too generic of an offering. So when I think of these categories, I think this is what you're going to face either today where you're already interning or working um, or certainly when you graduate and um, go on to those next career paths. You're going to work for organizations that either have a strong philosophy about marketing, they have a barrier or disbelief about marketing, or they're somewhere in the middle. And it's probably like a bell curve. You know, This percentage really gets it, embraces it, would like to be those 2020 people. These people down here um, never even wanna talk to you about the concept. And then the bulk of us in the middle, right, are probably working for people that have varying degrees of um, all of those categories. So in this part of the chapter, I say to you, how would you overcome those? You know, what would you do? We know um, from surveying the industry, just like I'm asking you to survey someone this semester or ask of your organization, do you have a marketing plan? We know that, or I know at least 10 years ago, you know, we would have three to four organizations out of 10 actually had a marketing plan. Today, our best estimate in the last few semesters is four to five. So in our nine, you know, not completely scientific process, it's just all of us going out and asking an organization, um, but it's better data than we've had. We know that it's still about 50% at best. Now of those five organizations writing marketing plans, you're gonna look at some this semester and I think you'll concur like I've concurred, not all of them are doing 2020 marketing. Not all of them are progressive in terms, they are stuck in the 80s and 90s. So even if they have a plan, they're not necessarily fully integrating it to today's or tomorrow's, you know, delivery of how we have to do it. So knowing that the bulk of us will walk into an organization 
that has fear or 1980s practices or disbelief or no need. The real question is, what and how will you overcome or how are you going to overcome these kind of barriers? And I would say in general, there's several techniques that if, you know, I'd like you to think about, like, what would you do really? But there's several things you probably could see doing. By the end of the semester, I hope you believe that by helping them understand elements of the marketing plan, whether it's the full thing or parts of it and how that can help marketing decisions, I think will also give you some evidence to start to minimize these things. When I work with a client, and um, again, they're only calling me to help them with marketing as if they're in that middle part of the bell curve. They'd like to be better. They have some fears though. How can I help them get better? The company that has no need or no interest at this end, you know, probably aren't ever calling me, but you might end up working for them. So, um, but the ones I work with are disbelief or fear. So we take things small and we show them how it works. I always gather that data that I talked about earlier about competition, about the market, et cetera. We help build our confidence in our decisions and it naturally comes out. Um, in that. And then again, when we make mistakes, we know why we made the mistake and what happened, and we improve on that every time. So sometimes if you're working for an organization that really is, has a lot of barriers to what we're going to talk about this semester, I say take it small for them, but give them testimonials and evidence. Show them how by doing this, this is what happened. Um, I'm going to use this term a lot this semester called the bobblehead. You know, so we're going to look for people to go, oh, I get it, I see, I know, and I want you to feel that this semester too. So we are going to face barriers. Chapter one is not painting a really beautiful picture of how we approach marketing in our industry. And that's why I find this class to be important. We're not just talking about generic marketing. We're talking about our industry and how we approach marketing, what we believe about marketing, and how we're going to utilize marketing. Some of the tools and discussions apply to any industry, but because we're creating this really unique experience for visitors and we are talking about uh, the beautiful things that we do in our business, uh, we're going to talk about marketing pretty differently. And it really ties into chapter two about the experience first. What we deliver here is really cool. <laughs> so I love being a marketer in our industry. I can't imagine. Uh, marketing widgets like those glasses again that would not be very exciting to me marketing our industry incredibly exciting incredibly dynamic and we're really lucky people to be studying and working in it so really the end of chapter one as I wrap this up finally did you say finally <laughs> is sorry I'm, I have to I have to feel like you're right here in the classroom with me so is the idea that there are a whole bunch of things we're gonna talk about this semester and this kind of crazy slide says, you know, our philosophy about what we believe to be important in our business and why we're doing what we're doing is really feeds this whole process. If you're in this business to just make money, then the way we're going to talk about marketing is probably going to help, help you have that happen, but you are not going to be as successful as if you're in this business to make a difference on a lot of ways for people. And the outcome might be money, the outcome might be other things. Um, but we want to make sure your why for being here is really strong and that makes a marketer like me it's a dream come true when i've got an organization passionate and excited about what they deliver it makes marketing so much easier than if i'm working with an organization that has other motives for the reason they're doing it and that they exist in our field so i hope you and i always work for people that care and are passionate and it's uh, going to be a lot easier for us to market them. Grand Valley State is one of those places. Um, you know, universities um, that I have had the luxury of working for, uh, like Central Michigan University too, there are places that care about people. So really easy to, to work like that. So market research is the center, the big data idea, right, is the core of marketing. It's going to feed everything we're doing quality surrounds us the quality of the experience is the base of all great marketing but it is about everything so remember quality remember big data and information is going to be the core center to us being strategic effective communicators implementing those decisions and evaluating those decisions as they go around the horn there so welcome to chapter one welcome to marketing 
Uh, thanks for spending time with me. Don't forget secret activity that only if you watch the videos do you know. You need to give me your post on what that's about. So thanks again for your time. I'll look forward to talking next week about Chapter 2, the why, the experience, and again, how fortunate are we that we work in an industry uh, that we get a chance every day to make a difference for people and uh, again, a marketer's dream. So happy day.